what's going on guys thank you for tuning in to connected by creatures tonight zach and i have an amazing guest that uh we're both beyond excited for i've been telling everybody that uh this this might be one of the most excited i've been for for a guest uh without further delay we have dr warren booth hello it's great to be here yes no, sir. thanks for having having us <clears throat> thanks for joining us sorry brother um we really do appreciate it bradley and i yeah, you know we, we we've kind of always got a running list of people that we want to have on and your name's been very near the top of that for a while so we appreciate the time no, it's great to be on it thanks for the invite yes I'm sir. sorry that i'm uh, going to disappoint you over the next hour or two hours <laughs> i highly doubt it no i highly doubt it as well and uh just for for our guest uh in the description i put uh, a little bit of some of the things that you focus on some of your uh your credentials and accolades give us kind of a rundown on what all your field of study is like i talked about like the uh facultative uh partho i talked about the uh, molecular ecology but just give us a rundown on kind of everything that you're into yeah sure so my um my degree is in genetics. My PhD is in evolutionary genetics. And what, I, what my lab really focuses on is how organisms adapt and evolve in urban settings. So we use urban pests as models uh, to study that, you know, things like insecticide resistance evolution and really showing that evolution can happen at a very rapid rate. Um, but about maybe 10 or 11 years ago, a friend of mine, Jeff Ronnie, uh, people might know him as Boophile, um, who breeds boas, he contacted me and, and told me about a a, uh, a woman that was breeding boas that, that had a litter of boas where she needed to know who the father was, basically. Um, and I tested those genetically, and I found out there was no father. So this was the first evidence of facultative parthenogenesis in boa constrictors. Um, and really, it was only about the, maybe the third record in snakes in general. It was very rare. It was considered very rare then. Um, you know, facultative parthenogenesis is where a female produces offspring without the use of a male. Mm -hmm. uh, and that first paper went worldwide. Um, the BBC picked it up, and from there it, it went across the world, and as a result, it got a lot of media, media attention. And within a couple of weeks, I started getting emails and phone calls and letters from people saying that they had found something similar, or they, they believed something similar happened in their collection of snakes, and did I want to test it, or could I test it? And this ranged from you know various pythons, boa, or sorry, um, ball pythons, retics, blood pythons, children's pythons, and into boas, and then into pit vipers. Uh, and recently we did some work on king cobras. Uh, we're about to do some work for Tom Crutchfield on, on um, crocodile monitors. Uh, and okay. it's just exploded from there. And, and it really showed us that, um, that that's not a rare phenomenon. It's actually quite common. Um, so the lab works on that a little bit. Um, I kind of call it my hobby research because we don't apply for grants to study it. It's all kind of stuff that I do on the weekends and in the evenings. Um, and it's nice because it's rewritten the textbooks in terms of like we because of that we now know that boas and pythons have X Y sex chromosomes instead of Z W. We know what happens to venom whenever uh, parthenogenesis happens. We know what happens to the genome whenever parthenogenesis happens. Kind of really cool stuff. It's no longer reporting it, um, you know, which I just consider like kind of stamp collecting. I want to know what the mechanisms that are driving it. So we play with yeah. that, uh, and we're also doing some work on. Um, kind of phylogenetics, so understanding species organizations. So we're doing work on carpet pythons, scrub pythons. Um, we're doing some stuff on, on white lip pythons. Um, again, just kind of hobby research. I get some undergrads involved in it and they get to do some work on it, but um, we're kind of working on that stuff as well. Um, but the snake stuff, just, you know, I, so I keep and I breed. I've got about 120 snakes. So I, I keep and I breed. I've been keeping and breeding snakes for about 27 years. So it's nice that this kind of stuff overlaps it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't want it to to overtake it. I, I you know I like having the research side of being a something that's informative uh, and something that's beneficial. And I I kind of keep it away from my snake breeding hobby as well. You know. So, yeah. And then regarding snakes, I, I keep a lot of boas and you know, boa constrictor and and Corala street boas mainly. Yeah. One of the one of the main questions or one of the questions that I had for you as far as with the partho was throughout your study and everything that you've witnessed so far, do you see any outside determining factors like whether it be a husbandry or a food that like that maybe attributes to more partho or it has a, is it random? See, that, 
that's a really good question. And that's something that I'm really interested in looking at at the moment. Um, so if we look back at early research, so let me, let me, let me preface this a little bit. Parthenogenesis, facultative parthenogenesis is found in uh, reptiles. So we've seen it a lot in snakes and some lizards. We also see it in, in sharks and we see it in birds. And the reason for this is they lack a genetic mechanism called genomic imprinting. Basically, the mother and the father have to switch on specific genes at certain times during embryonic development, otherwise an embryo doesn't form. This is why we don't have parthenogenesis in mammals, for example. Um, so with, with reptiles, uh, a lot of work was carried out in the 1970s in domestic turkeys and domestic chickens. And at that time, a couple of things came to light. One was that um, chickens and turkeys and quail that were inoculated with certain um, um, uh, kind of antiviruses and so on were, um, see, they seem to be more susceptible to parthenogenesis. Mm -hmm. So um, they got vaccinated for a certain thing and that seemed to switch something on. Um, I don't believe that that was the case. I think it was just, uh, there's something else that, that drove that. The next thing from there was that it might just be a simple autosomal recessive trait. Okay. And they find that, that parthenogenetic females would produce more parthenogenetic offspring and so on. So there could be a heritability to it. And I find that myself. So we've, we have bred parthenogenetic ball pythons and produced parthenogenetic offspring from those. We've also produced sexual offspring from them. Uh, years ago, a boa breeder uh, in the Northeast had a number of motley boas. There were siblings, and those females continually produced parthenogens in their litters. Okay. So my feeling is it's an autosomal trait. We have um, animals that I, I bred a parthenogenetic female boa, obviously to a, a sexual male, produced offspring, and we have those offspring that we're raising up. Um, the idea is that to, to potentially test whether it's a heritable trait. Um, and that's kind of a direction that we're we're moving in for that there. I believe it's just a simple recessive trait. Um, it's not detrimental, so it hasn't been lost through evolutionary processes, um, and it's just retained in the population. Very low frequency. So there's other evidence that supports that. So there's work on um, small-toothed sawfish, so a species of shark, and it showed that this very confined population, they're very endangered, a very confined population um, uh, harbored, I think it was seven parthen genetic females. Wow. Um, and the population was relatively inbred, so you expect small populations would increase in breeding like uh, the likelihood sure. of breeding highly, and as a result, the likelihood that that um, recessive trait is now in the homozygous form increases. So with mm -hmm. snake breeding, we do a lot of sibling to sibling crosses or um, parent offspring crosses to try and fix traits, and I think that's something that's arising from it. Um, so we now see it a lot in ball pythons and boas, especially because we breed a lot of those. Right, but we see it throughout the, the snake kind of phylogenetic tree. So that's a great question and something that we, we really want to think about more. So, you know, we've thought about sequencing the genome and looking for, well, what else is there? If we excluded all of the boa constrictor genome, for example, what other things are there that might be driving it? Are there bacterial strains or are there something else that we could then potentially inoculate females with? I really think it's, it's a recessive trait. And to, to kind of follow up on that with the animals that you, that you guys have, you know, witnessed and had the opportunity to study with mm -hmm. with Partho, uh, have you noticed anything about maybe certain localities of the different species that you've looked at? Like you said, small populations, like if it was maybe something that the animals evolved to continue producing offspring in smaller localities. Yeah, that, that's another great question, because, you know, the the original hypothesis that people would put forward for, for facultative parthenogenesis was a female gets washed up on an island or gets, gets um, moved to an area where there's no other males and as a result mm -hmm. produces parthenogenetically and those offspring. So um, if at this point in time, they didn't really know which sex would be produced, they assumed female. But at least at that point, the female would then produce more females, find a small population, and then eventually a male would appear in the population and that would then produce a sexual population. Um, we don't find it um, necessarily in um, specific localities. With, with ball pythons, you know, they're all coming from relatively the same place. They're all, mm -hmm. people are inbreeding and so on. Um, we found it in the wild in copperheads and cottonmouths, just by chance, uh, as part yeah. of another study. 
And those populations had equal numbers of males and females. There's no reason it should have been there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, and it was, when we looked at things like inbreeding, very little to minimal inbreeding. So I think it was just a, a freak occurrence of two recessive alleles coming into contact in, in that, um, uh, sorry, in that female, it was just a chance that, that was, she had a recessive allele and through this pro uh, parthenogenic process, um, she produced it. Um, with, with the advanced snakes, so things like um, pit vipers, cobras, uh, the colubrids, neurodia, stuff like that, they produce male parthenogenetic offspring. So actually that's more beneficial, right? Because a female produces a parthenogenetic offspring, that male, if healthy, can then breed back to the female and produce a right. small farming population of males and females. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a more beneficial kind of idea. We hope to test that a couple of years ago. We, we had a parthenogenetic copperhead um, at a collaborator's lab, and sadly, um, they were hesitant to pair it with the female back to the mother, and with, they were afraid the female would bite it, and it would kill it, and, and in the end, that male died. So we never got to test that. So hopefully, you know, we got contacted a lot about parthenogenetic um, uh, snakes, so hopefully we'll be able to find uh, one of those male parthenogens that we can bring back to a female. And uh, given that we've, we've bred uh, sexually produced male boas to parthenogenetic females and sexually produced ball pythons to female parthenogens and produced sexual offspring and parthenogens, it gives me hope that, you know, they're, they're, it's a beneficial, it, it could be beneficial in, in the right populations, but sure. parthenogens in, it, it, themselves are not very good. They're not very healthy. Yeah, that was going to be my follow-up question was just um, in terms of you, you're saying that you, you and, and correct me if I misunderstood this, um, that you think that we're going to start seeing this kind of more often due to the way that, that we're breeding that. And, and I and I would tend to assume, again, just my elementary understanding of the stuff, um, that it might be more likely that you would see it more often in the wild, like where you do have populations that's occurring because those females are now much more likely to produce every year if they do carry that trait and have that ability to reproduce without having to come into contact with a male while also still being able to sexually reproduce, you know, with a male. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think, I think females in the wild that have it will keep doing it. Sure. Um, if they, if the offspring they produce are healthy, then they should, be retained in the population and but remember mm -hmm. that the parthenogens that are produced are basically really highly inbred sure homozygous pretty much across their entire genome apart from a very small part of it mm -hmm. and the very ends of the chromosomes that don't code for anything yeah um so therefore they're not the healthiest think about the most inbred thing you you might think of and they tend to get knocked out pretty rapidly so short term that might be fine um population wise I think in these very small, isolated populations where it occurs, you might find it more frequently. Um, but where we're seeing it most commonly is, of course, in captivity, because we're doing a lot of breeding. And, sure. and thankfully, you know, I've always said this for the last 10 years, you know, we see many snake breeders that might not even have a, a high school level education, and yet they know Mendelian genetics really well. Yeah. They, in their head, they know exactly if they cross X with Y, could be three or four different genes on each side, they know what they're going to produce. Yeah. Um, and when they don't, and when something obscure pops out that could be homozygous for a trait that the female had or the male, mm -hmm. um, then they know something is afoot. And years ago, people might have thought about these null mutations where one of the, one of the parents lacked that gene and therefore it appears homozygous in the offspring. We've kind of shown that that's not the case. Um, sure. They might have thought where it was, you know, it was actually heterozygous for something they didn't know about. That could be the case. but. We can work around that, and we can genetically we can test it very, um, very easily nowadays. But you know, we'll certainly see it more in captivity. Um, sure. We've only it's parthenogenesis, facultative parthenogenesis, has only been detected in the wild in three instances: small tooth, oh, wow. yeah, small tooth sharks, and then copperheads and cottonmouths. So um, our paper on cottonmouths and copperheads was the first to record that, and that was in two thousand and. 2012. Oh, wow. Um, the reason it takes a lot of work to sample, you know, we, we caught it by, by chance. We had a collaborator that was working on copperheads and continues to work on copperheads in the wild. And they were collecting gravid females every year, allowing them to give birth in, in the lab, then releasing the mother and the offspring after taking various different measurements and stuff like that to really sure. understand the characteristics of the breeding population. Mm -hmm. Well, we published a paper a year earlier that kind of showed the traits that are associated with parthenogenesis, what we expect in litters or clutches of, of advanced snakes or, or, or the primitives like the boas and pythons. 
And sure. he was reading that and he said, well, I looked through my 45 liters and I found one that fits, or I found two that fit the characteristics that we, we published. And I tested them both genetically because I had those samples for another study anyway. And one of those uh, litters turned out to be, uh, the male turned out to be a parthenogen. And then the same thing happened. We were talking about it with another friend who studied copper or cotton mouths. And she said, I had the same thing. And she sent me all of her samples and we found the same thing in cotton mouths. Uh, and they, were, they produced healthy, healthy male offspring. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. So with those, they only produce, you know, um, with the litters, they tend to be, high numbers of infertile ova for the pit vipers and stuff like that, and maybe one or two male offspring. Very often they're highly deformed because of the high levels of breeding. Mm -hmm. But on rare instances, we find healthy animals produced, and, and those two cases were actually healthy animals that were produced. See, this is why I was so excited for this, because I've already learned something, because I was under the impression <laughs> that, uh, you know, things that were, you know, partho babies were in essence, a genetic clone of the mother and yeah, were, yeah. you know, were, were all female. And I didn't yeah. realize that there were male offspring in certain species. And yeah. it makes me wonder, um, uh, it, you said that the, uh, the one that they had that they didn't, you know, want to reproduce and breed back to the mother. Uh, I was wondering if there was like any sterility issues in the males yeah. that come from, you know, we want to test that. I don't believe so. We really wanted to test that, and um, even when the male died, I tried to get that male so I could have taken it to the lab and dissected out his testes and determine whether the sperm were at least normally structured. And sure. Just we couldn't get it in time. Uh, but the fact that we've bred parthenogenetic genetic females and they produce fine, it's, it's right. raising them up to <clears throat> to to adulthood, and then their their whole gestation is kind of weird. But to go back to one thing you said, so yeah, so, so they're definitely not clones of the mother. I, I call them half clones because um, if you think about an animal that's heterozygous for a lot of traits, the parthenogen will not be heterozygous, it'll be homozygous for traits. But say you've got five different traits that they're heterozygous for, they could be homozygous for one, and a homozygous mutant for one, and homozygous wild type for the rest, or any combination. Yeah. So it means in something like a litter of boas that are parthenogenetic, you could have 22 boas and they're all genetically different. Now they're all half clones of the mother, but to each other, they're all genetically different because they, they, just that combination, was it homozygous recessive, or, uh, sorry, wild type or homozygous mutant is a, is a coin flip. Um, so they're certainly not clones of the mother, so they're, but they're half clones. That's, uh, that's amazing. Like, I, I'd love <laughs> that, just that idea that, you know, it, it, the, even though it's a, it's a partho baby, that it's taken two sides, you mm -hmm. know, from the mother, if, yeah. because obviously like you said if it was homozygous for whatever the elements may be in there and then having that mix and match throughout the you know the yeah. litter yeah. That, that's that's crazy and that's really interesting because you know now with you know us breeding multiple different traits into these animals if they produce parthen genetically that that clutch of that litter can be totally phenotypically totally different sure. um, because of all these different combinations but that's also why some of the animals could be healthy and some of them not because you can have all of these little minor genes, some of these genes that are slightly deleterious, right? They're not mm -hmm. good if they're in the homozygous form. Sure. So again, with that coin flip, some of the offspring might get the homozygous mutation, which is not good and end up with kinked, you know, like a kink yeah. tail or kinking or no eyes or whatever. Whereas the other ones might be, might be wild type or it might be, yeah, it might be wild type for it and therefore healthy. So again, right. it's that whole coin flip of it, you know, so it's that's a mixed bag. Yeah, totally a mixed bag. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. My brain. <laughs> I'm trying to take it all in. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And uh, I, I, I still have so many questions on Partho, but I don't, I don't want us to just focus on that because there's so much other information that I want to talk to you about. Uh, sure. And you saying, you know, that your your degree was in genetics and mm -hmm. you know evolutionary genetics, and you talking about how it's not necessarily this big long thing that it can happen more rapidly than mm -hmm. you know we we are realizing yeah and when i was a kid my dad always brought up to me you know anytime that we got into a conversation about evolution he would uh he would say you know bring up ddt 
with mm-hmm. flies mm-hmm. and you know how quick that that adaptation you know happened and yeah. i think people get so much so caught up in like when they hear that trigger word evolution it throws their head into that space of you know well people came from you know yeah. and yeah. Well, long term and yeah. they don't it's understand that it's just change. Short term. You know, evolution is occurring around us, you know, and DDT is a great example. So we actually study the evolution of insecticide resistance in my lab. And we've got a paper coming out soon that shows with bed bugs. We use urban pests as model systems. Bed bugs are a great model for that because in uh, they were very common around the time of the First and Second World War. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1948, they introduced DDT. And that wiped out most urban pests. Right? But within four years, bed bug populations started to arise that were resistant to DDT. Mm-hmm. And DDT acts on the sodium channel of your cell, so it causes neuronal mismatch, or sorry, non functioning. Basically, it leaves, if, if DDT binds to it, it causes that, that sodium channel to stay open, so you're constantly sending messages. And therefore, it leads to paralysis of the muscles, and the animals die from paralysis as, as a result. Sure. Um, it just takes one mutation in that gene. Right. And then. And it's gone, right? Yeah. Um, and we've shown that, and we've actually been tracking populations over the last 15 years, and we've shown that the, the frequency of resistance has increased dramatically to the point now where all populations that we study, hundreds and hundreds of populations, are all highly resistant. And that's evidence of rapid evolution. It's evidence that, that you get these small mutations that occur that are, that are beneficial. And, um, and we're exerting that pressure on it. We're, we're adding, so DDT's gone a long time, but we still use, use pyrethroids and stuff like that, and pyrethroid mm-hmm. insecticides. They've got the same mode of functioning. So it's mm-hmm. the exact same process. So it happens all around us. All mutation is, is a change in gene frequencies over time. You know, so populations are constantly evolving, and through natural selection, they might evolve traits that are cold tolerant or warm tolerant or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't take much for those things to set in. You know, so yeah. it's, uh, it's just that, you know, people think, humans from monkeys and that's not the case at all that's very deep time evolution but evolution is occurring all around us at, at, at right now so yeah well and you know <laughs> and in i think probably the best example uh you know or a, a very layman's example in humans is how quickly we're evolving and adapting to the technology that's being put out you know, like if you look at children, like young kids right now, they're they're introduced to these things so early in their life, you know, that things that people have struggled with, you know, in older generations, the new technologies like children adapt to it super fast now. And, and that's, yeah, that's a good point, because, we, you know, I don't know much about the evolution of behavioral traits, but many of them have genetic links to it. So therefore... Mm-hmm you'll find a subset of the population that really adapted. Like, you know, on that vacation, 3,500 miles of driving, I had to keep my four-year-old and my seven-year-old quiet in the back of the truck somehow. So they had iPads, and it's amazing how you can see a four-year-old swiping through stuff and asking Siri to play certain things. And, you know, I, I wasn't doing that at four. I don't I wasn't even playing with Star Wars toys at four, right? Maybe I yeah. was. But, you know, so it's amazing to see how, how, how behaviors change. And there can be, there can be behavior, there's certainly genetic links to behaviors because... Um, there's studies that have been done on things like um, swift foxes in Colorado, I think, where they showed that um, there was a genetic association between animals that were bold or shy or mod- or in between. Yeah. And the, the, sh- the bold ones were the ones that would always be found dead on the roads because they had no fear of humans and mm-hmm. stupid with traffic. And it was the shy ones that stayed away. And whether that was a genetic trait, I believe it was. Um, it kind of shows a heritability, therefore, to to a behavioral trait. So I think, you know, I think you're along the right lines whenever you say about how we evolve to the use of technology. I think there's a certain level of, um, uh, there, there's genetic associations with our ability to, to learn processes rapidly. Well, with, with the behavior, you know, with it being genetically passing down behavioral ideas, like I read a thing one time where it was talking about, they did a study with field rats. Mm-hmm. And they had, you know, X generations of field rats in captivity and bred them in captivity. And the, you know, like fifth generation F5 from wild caught, they could uh, introduce a shadow over them 
that wasn't in the shape of a bird and they would have no change in like heart rate you know they're they're they wouldn't change physically and then with the shadow of a bird like it, it would they would have an instant heart rate change like it was genetically yeah. imprinted on them yeah. to mm-hmm. fear this yeah, uh yeah. you know predator that's and it, that, cool. that stuff's just so interesting to me yeah I think, yeah. yeah that's you know i think we're seeing a lot of um studies coming out that allow people to kind of link genetic traits with environmental conditions and so on you know there's a, there's that great work that was done on on foxes in russia you know, with by the seventh generation, they gone from the wild type to these fluffy ones with floppy ears, and they were placid, and you know, and it's kind of amazing what what breeding can do. So think about you know, that's like seven generations. Think about we can do that in ball pythons and boas in in what mm-hmm. fifteen years, you know, yeah, twenty years. So we can, you know, that's that's just the process of domestication. We can change behaviors very very rapidly. Look at look at God. I remember twenty five years ago, an imported retic was horrible. Import yeah, blood types were terrible, and look at them now. You know, they're just totally different animals behavioral wise. Sure. And, and sure. Um, you know, and I think we can keep driving that. We can select for animals that you know. Of course, in, in litters of clutches, there's always that great one. There's a pain in the ass, doesn't feed well, but we really yeah. push, we push it. You know, realistically, yeah. we should be culling that one and selecting the ones that feed first and more readily. Yes. And you know, and that's a very good point. I cannot remember who it was that talked about it, but they they said that they do that with their hog nose. Because a lot of people know hognose are known mm-hmm. to be difficult feeders, um, you know, just these, that, this, that, and the other. And, and, and basically this guy was saying, he said, look, he said, it might sound terrible. He said, but I don't, I don't go out of my way to try to make these babies thrive. If they're mm-hmm. not thriving on their own, if, if I'm going to have to assist feed and this, that, and the other, he said, I just don't. And, and, and it's terrible. Um, he said to have to call those animals or, or to watch them kind of slowly waste away. Uh, but he said, as a result of having done that, I wish I could remember the breeder cause I would love to actually talk to him a little bit more about that and, and, and some more details. But he said, basically by the time he had done that for like three, four generations, he said, I don't have issues with, with my babies, yeah. you know, in terms of that kind of thing. And so it's, it's, it is very interesting that the way that behaviors can be inherited um, genetically. Yeah, why is that? Why that's interesting with hognose is because mammals aren't their natural prey in the wild. Yes, right? yes. they're gonna be frog eaters in the wild. So therefore, mm-hmm. that's us selecting those that are more likely. Because even those bad feeders, if you, if you send them, they'll feed. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, yeah. if you give them, you know, frogs, they'll feed. It's mm-hmm. just they're not not their natural instinct to do that. Yes. But we should ideally be selecting for the mammal eating ones that um, sure that feed right. Like for the first ever species of snake that I bred was western hognose snakes. Okay. Yeah, 26 years ago, I produced two clutches of, um, I think it was 24 in total, 23 hatched. Uh, well, 24 hatched, one was deformed. But they all, you know, they shed within 15 or 30 minutes, and they all took defrost pink mice. Yeah, that was, that's that amazing. was 26 years ago. Yeah. yeah and I, I, they would have been, I don't know, maybe, I don't know what, how many generations in captivity they would have been at that point. But now we're, we're much further on, you know, and, and I think rarely do we see ones that really need to be coaxed to eat. You know, hognose sure. are a great example of how domestication has has resulted in the traits that we really want to see in terms of feeding. Mm-hmm. You see it in some of the other kind of lizard eating and frog eating species. We're moving towards that. You know, like I, uh, you know, I work with Corallus tree boas, and this mm-hmm. past year we produced um, two different lineages of two different localities of Russian burgerines, so the Trinidad tree boas and the Costa Rican tree boas, and they don't take they don't take mammals um, from from birth and and my Costa Rican and my Trinidad they're both F one generation from wild so we had the Trinidad but was collected on Trinidad first time in 25 years they're the only ones in captivity in the world um, what's amazing about those is their first meal were small mice that were defrost left dead on the bottom of the cage wow. that was nuts whereas the Costa Rican ones I fed I had to um, wash the mice and then dip them in chicken broth i think it was and that because they're normally would like <laughs> birds in nests and lizards yeah. and stuff like that but it's amazing how these animals you know they some of them are just pains in the ass it's the same species other ones are just like yeah fuck, i'll, I'll eat a, a yeah I'll eat whatever and leave sitting in the bottom of the cage <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I don't expect this you know didn't ever expect to see that i thought i was going to be sitting there you know for four hours each night with the animals yeah to it to strike and then and they did great you know but i as much as I say that we should be culling them, there's been enough animals that I've produced over the last 25, 26 years where it's like, that's the one. 
and it's always the yeah. pain in the ass feeder. And I'm like, I'm going to mm -hmm. work with this thing until it's eating. Sure. It's a difficult you know, thing to accept. Yeah. Yeah. I don't it's think it's ever going to I think in my mind, but I, I don't necessarily put that in play. Yeah. The, the also, logical scientific brain. <laughs> yeah. There are ones that I'm like, you know what? I am just going to leave this and see how it goes. So I have done that mm -hmm. as well. And if they, if sure. they succumb, so I got a king snake and that takes care of stuff like that. You know, sure. I've got one pet king snake that, that will consume the, the ones that failed to thrive. So if I get it, if I got one that finally eats and then it's still a pain in the ass, then it's not going to work for me. Um, sure. And then I'll just, I'll just introduce it to the king snake. So. Yeah, because at that point it's not thriving. It's it's you yeah. know you 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 are you are for you are forcing something to kind of survive that that in reality even in captivity maybe shouldn't just and and should certainly not genetically be you know continued in in right. terms and of that. There, could be, other, there yeah. could be other things. There could be, uh, there could be other things going on with that animal. Yes, right yes, Constance. that we don't know about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I actually wanted to ask you a little bit. Um, so I had a, <clears throat> I had a I had a reticulated python. It was uh, less than two years old. And um, it, it unfortunately became very ill, literally seemingly overnight, came out of nowhere. And um, I thought, oh, my gosh, I've done something wrong. It, it had developed a skin, you know, a skin infection and, and ultimately was septic. But it was literally like within like three days, what it seemed like. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately uh, had a necropsy done on the animal. I had to put it to sleep. And it was it was ridden with cancer. The, the vet literally yeah. said, Zach, I don't know how the animal was breeding. His lungs were completely full up with cancer. Right. Um, and upon you know, speaking to a lot of other breeders, not just in reticulated pythons, but just in a lot of other animals that they've had that they lost just very rapidly and unexpectedly, um, there, it seems like the, the conversation is coming up more and more that a lot of breeders are starting to see cancer coming up in these very young animals, mm -hmm. um, kind of unexplicably. Um, I just didn't know if you kind of had any thoughts on that. Um, I, there's some theories floating around that maybe it could do, could have something to do with the rodent populations that we're using. Um, I, and think I, and, I think it's and, a terrible. I think it's a terrible trait as well. You see it in dogs. Right, okay. So yeah, yeah. I was in I was in Knoxville a couple of nights ago, staying with a friend, and mm -hmm. he breeds Irish wolfhounds. And they said within Irish wolfhounds, um, uh, there's um, bone cancer can pop up very very young, and it's and it's in lineages, it's in lines. Okay. So it's a heritable. Like that's why you go to when you go to the doctors, they ask, is there any evidence, any history of cancer in your family? Sure. It's heritable. Um, okay. And I think. Again, with um, because an animal survives and doesn't develop cancer, doesn't mean it doesn't have genes that are associated with cancer. To to pass it's the, sure. it's the it's the um, environmental interactions that can switch those on. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, you could have a breeder that's, that's got an apparently very healthy group of, of animals, and they produce an offspring, and those offspring could develop cancer at any time. Okay, um, what triggers that? We don't really know, but I, I think. Okay. Again, it's just the side effect of us inbreeding. Sure. Um, and again, while I say it, you know, I, I, I um, try and encourage people when they're buying snakes to, to not buy siblings. Mm -hmm. But I've done that. I've bought siblings and I've bred siblings and I'll continue to breed siblings sure. with each other. Sure. You know? Sure. So it's kind of, you know, we're, we're kind of, it's, our, it's, our, it's the issue that we're driving ourselves, you know. So mm -hmm. there's nothing that's going to help it unless we start outbreeding. Which, can, which yes. can be associated with its own level of problems. Yeah. But until we start doing that, then then you're going to see these things happen. So it happens in Morelia a lot. I like, know mm -hmm. cancer pops up in Morelia. Um, it happens in retics, and retics are relatively close to Morelia genetically. Sure. You know, so I wouldn't be surprised if you don't start seeing it more in boas and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, sadly, it's very it's interesting. Terrible traits. Yeah. The more yeah. we yeah. embryo so, the fixed traits, the more you're going to see it pop up. Again, it's one of those right. little genes that can be hitchhiking along with other things that we don't notice mm -hmm. uh, it appears and sadly with snakes like we joked for years um my friend that i was with in knoxville i've known him for about 30 years and he keeps snakes and you know we knew each other back in northern ireland um you know we've, we've said in the past like snakes look their best when they're just about to die you know so it's like three days yeah. they could be they could yeah. be breeding everything's great and the next minute you turn around and they're doing that whole death flail around their cage and they're like yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, that's exactly how that male was. I mean, he was great. I was introducing the female who coincidentally, what it was, they were the only, they were the only pair in the world. It, it, that, it was the only pair, the only time that pairing had been done. And they were the only two visual tigers that had survived from the clutch. Yeah. There was only three eggs that actually made it. Um, and so I still have his sister. Uh, mm -hmm. she's a het, she's a 50% Slayer tiger, uh, het rennet ghost. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so I still have a sister and she's doing wonderful, but yeah, yeah the male, I mean, again, he was, displaying breeding activity i mean he was eating voraciously and then literally just like overnight within a week just you know practically like was refusing food looked terrible 
vet said, Hey, he's septic. Like he developed a terrible infection because his immune system was suppressed. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And it was, it was just, it was so rapid. So yeah, it's, it's very it's interesting. Terrible. Over the 20 something years I've been keeping snakes, I've seen it happen. You know, I've mm-hmm. seen animals that are just outwardly just great. Yeah. Doing everything you expect them to do. And then you open up your cage one day and it's dead. You know, it happened, happened mm-hmm. to me a couple of months ago with a blood python. So I got some mm-hmm. caramel, um, the caramel albano sumatrans. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I was so funny. I was just talking to a friend of mine, Mac Robinette, the night before. I was, Mac and I were joking about stuff. And Mac was like, he was like, uh, the one thing I'm guaranteed to do is kill blood pythons. He said, one day, <laughs> everything's great. And you just open up your tub and it's dead. And I was like, that's ah, bullshit. These, these things are easy to keep. You know, I used to keep them and breed them. They're so easy. And literally the next day I went down, pulled up this tub and there it is belly up. Like, uh, what the fuck? Called yeah. him up and he's like, yeah, just, just, just by knowing me, I've killed one of your blood pythons. You know, so it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. I would never have guessed that it was going to roll over and die. And yeah, I never, sure. I didn't do a necropsy on it, but uh, it was just a, a weird freak occurrence, you know? Sure. It's one of those things. And, and again, like you said, you know, genetically, obviously that animal was just weak. And so it, and unfortunately at the end of the day, it is for the best that those animals do pass and, and they don't pass on whatever genetics is, issues yeah. that they do have. And so, um, yeah, I, you know, I, same thing. I worry cause I have the sister of the same male. And so I'm like, obviously there is some link right in, in that, in that bloodline. Well, the good um, thing now for what, what you should do with that is I'd breed it. Something and that's, and that's, so, and that's, yep, yeah. that's exactly then, what I'm doing. And then you're going to have two things. You're going to have a bunch of offspring that, are outbred from it and therefore reducing the likelihood of harboring any traits sure. that might be associated with that. But also you've got males that you can breed back to that female mm-hmm. and again try to right. go for that breed. You know? Exactly. And that, that's that's in, that's entirely the plan. We've got um uh you know a hundred percent a pure a pure dwarf uh Tom Belong in locality retake mm-hmm. that we're gonna um work with Garrett Hall on. So yeah, it's it's right. the, the project ultimately is is gonna be better. Um, so, you know, I've, I've communicated that to a lot of people that have asked me about it and I'm like, no, all, like in the long run, it's, it's a good thing that this happened. It's, it's, it is sad, but it is good that yeah. it went the way that it did because otherwise I would have had those two, the, these two siblings now who both obviously are predisposed for this issue, right. further compounding the problem. And then this, this project that's also, also obviously is very important. I remember um, your it female would have been hurt a, for it. Remember your female might not necessarily carry the genes. For that sure. Right. Well, right. Yes. You know, yes. The joys of recombination. Yeah. So the whole mixed, mixed bag totally fine. conversation from earlier. Yeah. 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 So. so it's a, uh, it's a pain in the ass. You know, I've had those breedings that you're really excited about and then yeah. it just doesn't work for some reason, whether one of them dies or, or whatever, or they're not compatible, mm-hmm. but you know, we yeah. I think, I think what people need to really think about is that it's worth out breeding every now and again. Yes. You know, so sure. I know that we try to fix all these, so many of these genetic traits in their homozygous form, but it's, it's always worthwhile thinking, well, maybe it's time to outbreed to something different, you know, Absolutely. so those, those normals really have a value whenever yes. we think yeah. about it. Yeah, I love that you said that. Yeah, I love so, that you said that. It's very important. And I, and I do know some breeders that they do make a point, you know, they will literally bring in like a wild caught African import just, mm-hmm. you know, once every little while to throw into their projects just yes, to right. get a little bit, a little bit of some unique genetics, you know, truly unique genetics, because again, you know, even if you're buying from someone else in the hobby, especially with ball pythons at this point, yeah, like chance of them all being linked. Th- there's a good, exactly. There's a good chance that somewhere and, not that many generations ago that they, that they're linked. So, and even if they're not, they're still homozygous across a lot of their genome due to the yes. level of inbreeding we carry out, you know? So yes. like I look at, you know, as much as I don't support bringing in large numbers of wild caught animals, nor do I. I think the females are really beneficial to breeders, and the males are really mm-hmm. beneficial to kids that want to have their first pet. Yes, yes. No, I, I absolutely you know? agree. So, they certainly have a beneficial kind of role. Like I, I keep a lot of tree boas, and I still have. You know, I don't, I don't buy a lot, but I've got wild caught tree boas because sure, you know, I want certain lineages, I want certain traits, and I want to outbreed to certain things. You know, so. Mm-hmm. So another thing that I I wanted to touch on with you, because uh, we haven't really had someone on that uh, that has a a really big boa collection. Uh, Most of the people that we've had on are either Python or Colubrid people. And, uh, you know, I know that you have a have a fairly good size boa collection. And I was wondering at this point in, you know, in the hobby and in the industry, what the prevalence of IBD is in uh in boas good question um i don't know i it comes and goes in waves in terms of people reporting it 
So sure. we know there's a virus associated with it. I think it's a renovirus that we can test for. Um, and I spoke to a friend uh, maybe a month ago who had to put down, I think, six or seven animals mm-hmm. because of IBD. Um, uh, I don't, I'm sure it's probably, I'm sure that virus is probably prevalent in many people's collections. It's whether it actually manifests as IBD. Um, so it can, the animal can carry it, but it doesn't necessarily exhibit the traits associated with it. And, and potentially, I'm not sure about the heritability of it. There's not been a lot of studies to show whether females can pass it down to their offspring in utero or whether they have to come into contact in terms of kind of some kind of mucus or blood transfer from like mites or whatever. Sure. So um, I certainly think people that have really big collections might have it, just like mm-hmm. um, uh, nor, uh, the nidovirus in pythons. Sure. Sure. I think many people that keep large groups of pythons might have that as well. Um, but we can test for it, right? So you get, it's a simple PCR test that you can test for a renovirus and see whether it's there in your, or nidovirus, whether it's there in your collection. And if it's there, then, you know, the animal might not be exhibiting traits, but you should probably isolate that away from everything else and, and sure. try not to breed from it. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know how... I don't hear a lot of people talking about the classic IBD, you know, stargazing, head spinning, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I used to hear a lot of more, maybe about 15 or 20 years ago, I used to hear more people talking about it. Sure. I certainly haven't seen it. And, you know, my popul- my, my collection has been uh, largely closed. Um, I don't really buy any more snakes. Um, mm-hmm. So therefore, I, I kind of know what I've got and I know what's, what's not in sure. it. Right? Sure. And even when I buy new animals, I... Um, isolate them elsewhere for about a year so they don't come into my collection for about a year um, mm-hmm. and I, I test them before that you know one of the okay. things about running a lab is that I can do that kind of thing as well um, sure. but um, I think it's certainly about just like nidovirus I think a renovirus is probably there and, and and in those instances where it might switch over to IBD people just have to be careful with it you know for sure it kind of sucks it's uh, it's something that yeah. knocks out collections you know um, and there's some really big breeders in the u.s past breeders that had ibd in their collections or popped up and um and i think a lot of that at time was just due to bad quarantine people didn't quarantine animals and people still sure. don't quarantine animals it's the most yeah. important aspect about keeping snakes is that you should be really strict about quarantining stuff but people are so they want to buy their animal and they want to breed it now or they want to breed Immediately. it in three months time mm-hmm. and you got no i I've watched a friend's collection get totally destroyed um, from not quarantining, lost sure. a really high-end group of animals, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars worth of animals, two hundred thousand dollars worth of animals gone because of not quarantining. Yeah, um, risk versus so, reward, and I think I think a lot of people take really big risks, whether they even realize it or not. Because I think I think that's the thing is I think the conversation is that when this stuff comes up in conversation, people tend to shut down in this hobby. They're like, oh, we don't talk about that kind of thing. Like yeah. whether they're literally saying that or that's kind of just, well, yeah, I don't I don't, it's not something I have to worry about. I buy from reputable people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think, I think that unfortunately, I think we're going to, I don't know that we're going to see like that coming back or whatever, becoming more of a common issue, but I do think that it's just, yeah, that I don't think that the, the conversation has been clear enough to people that it really is important. Um, there's too many bad examples out there. And, and again, people are chasing the money. They're like, I need this animal to breed in a year, or I don't have the room in my house for a quarantine room. And, and, and I don't have the patience or the time mm-hmm. to actually go ahead and do that. Um, and, and I, and I need the money tomorrow. I need, I need this animal to breed so I can, so it can pay me, Sadly, which is unfortunate. To, it's the wrong way to think yeah. about a hobby, right? It absolutely is. Yes. Yeah, when you it absolutely is. Cash, you know, it's, this whole idea of investment, I just, it kind of cracks me up a little bit, you know, you mm-hmm. should be into it for the hobby, not the investment. Yeah. You know, living animals are not an investment. Nope. Um, but you know, I don't watch a lot of YouTube kind of reptile stuff anymore. I kind of distance myself from that, but I, sure. I, you know, for a while, I, I would watch people unboxing animals that they just got in and brought straight into a rack in their room. Mm-hmm. And, and these are people that should know better, you know, people that have got lots of followers. And, yeah. And it's like, you just have no idea. It's just going to take one animal. And yeah. You might buy and I've been rep- guilty of that myself. To, to you admit, might buy from I mean, know, reputable people, but that doesn't mean that their collections are clean. You know, they mm-hmm. might have nidovirus or renovirus mm-hmm. in their collection. They haven't seen it. But it doesn't mean that their animals might not be carrying it, and, sure. um, and that just is a, a recipe for disaster. You know, I'm mm-hmm. I'm very lucky in that 
having a lab and having different rooms associated with my lab, I can bring animals in, I can set them up there. So my office at work has got a whole bunch of, of, of emerald tree boas. They were wild caught. They'll never be here. They will never, sure. ever enter my, my collection of, uh, of emerald tree boas that I've got here because of the risk of um, regurgitation syndrome and so on. Um, their offspring will come here, but the animals sure. themselves won't. And I've also okay. got another room where I can bring in animals that are wild caught. So, for example, two years ago, maybe, at Arlington, I was with, there with a friend and he bought some animals. He asked if I could ship them to him, you know, because I can drive from, from Arlington to Tulsa and then ship them out to him. And when I put the animals, I drove straight to my lab, put them, set them up there. And the next day, whenever I looked at them, there were mites on the, on the paper. You know, mm. if I had brought them straight here, I would have brought mites into my collection. The last yeah, thing I have been a mess. I have not yeah. had that in a long, long time, and I don't want to even think about that. Um, no. So, um, again, quarantining is just a, a really important thing to think about. Again, it's people just, they're either lazy or they don't think it's important. I think it's a lot of ignorance, and I think you you nailed it too with the with the YouTube content creators. There's a lot of people with large channels that are just simply not um, leading by example. Um, I think that's you know obviously we're all aware that this hobby has continued to grow and grow and grow, and, and it just seems to be growing faster. I, I keep telling people all the time that I think that this this hobby is actually I think we're on the verge of having a real large explosion as long as um, you know the legality issues that we are facing don't don't catch up with us. Um, I think, but I, I think that within the next five years, I think that things are really, really going to continue to just get very, very big, very fast. And, um, I do, I think again, that's why conversations like this are important. That's why content like this is important is for us to talk about the stuff. And, and I hope that, you know, again, I, you know, I, I have already started putting things in place for myself to make adjustments for that. And I hope that others will do the same, especially those big name people that, um, you know, unfortunately have not been leading by that example. Cause like you said, all it takes is one. It's, it's just that simple, and then everything you have is ruined. Yeah. You know, and like I, I've always said, there's there's two simple things that people should think about with their reptiles. One is only get what you really like. Don't think yeah. about chasing these dollar signs. Sure. Because that animal that you get might not breed. It might not be compatible with your males or females. It might die, and you yeah. invested a ton of money in something that could end up in the toilet. Sure. Also, along those lines, especially with things like ball pythons, and a lot mm -hmm. of incomplete dominant traits, they drop in value so fast. Yes. And I've seen people lose their ass on banana ball pythons and mm -hmm. lesser ball pythons and, and so on that went, like I remember whenever Ralph produced the first leucistic and his lessers went from 25,000 to 50,000. And I know a guy yeah. who got a second mortgage on his house and two years later, those things crashed. Yeah. And um, look at what happened with banana ball pythons. God, I was at Daytona. Yeah. I don't know, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, and I saw two male bananas for 25,000 each. Yeah. And I went at Arlington, they were about 75 bucks or 80 bucks or something. Yeah. Animal. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a pet grade animal. It's a pet animal at this point. Look at yeah. the scale of stuff. You know, it's just yeah. a disaster. It's a whole lot of problems. Um, so mm -hmm. people think about these dollar signs and what they're going to make back from it, and, and it rarely works. So think about sure. what you really want and, and buy animals that you're really excited about. There's nothing in my group of animals, about 125 snakes, that I don't want. And that's not there mm -hmm. for a reason. Um, and also, just whenever you get them, just quarantine. Just be really sensible. Sure. Be careful who you buy from, and be careful how you set it up. Just quarantine it. Don't scrimp yeah. on the on the enclosures and so on. You know, just don't spend five grand on a snake and put it into a twenty dollar, fifty dollar rack. Made tub, you know, with no <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I invest all the stuff. Pretty much all the money I make from snakes, I put right back into snakes. So, sure. So, yeah. yeah. You know, that's uh, that's honestly the reason that I was asking the the IBD question was uh, I'm super nervous about stuff like that. Like uh, you know, I, I'm real real weird about uh, you know, my wife in uh at Arlington, she decided that she wanted to get some tokes. And like, you know, tokes are a known carrier of crypto mm -hmm. and like they're not even allowed in the same vicinity as yeah. the rest of the reptiles, you know, and I, I I personally love boas, but like, you know, I've, I've read so much stuff and seen horror stories to where like, you know, the the virus that turns into IBD, like you can have it and it'd be dormant in boas mm -hmm. for eight, for nine long years time. and they can be mm -hmm. carrying it. But the second that it's introduced to Python, it just decimates Pythons. 
Yeah, so also remember that there's a lot of other things that can exhibit characteristics of IBD. Yes. Like that yes. that you know, um, stargazing, head spinning. Mm -hmm. So bacterial infections can do it. Insecticide exposure can do it. Heat can do it. Like I had a boa um, 15 years ago, hypohead albino, and uh, it was great. And then one day I looked at it, it was spinning, it was doing the whole thing, and it freaked me out. And it turned out whenever I looked at that rack, it was one level of the rack was malfunctioning and the heat had jacked right up. Oh, wow. So the animal, whenever I, whenever I, it was like 118 degrees mm -hmm. and uh, it basically was fried, you know? Yeah, it developed a neurological issue because yeah. of the heat, yeah. So, so people jump to conclusions too fast sure. as well. As soon as they would see that thing, and, they think IBD. Yeah. Yeah, and um, vets do it too. You know, the, the snake that I the snake that I had that had cancer, that was like, oh, we, it, it this could be IBD. This could be, and I'm like, okay, well, I I don't think that's the case. Yeah. Obviously, I you know, but we I went through all of the procedures. We had all the testing done. Um, we sent blood work off to Florida State University even to have mm -hmm. like a full panel done, and 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 then obviously the necropsy, you know, made it very clear as exactly what was going on. But yeah, it it you know when when a, a, any a lot of these vets, um, and nothing against vets. A lot of vets, they have a textbook to go by and they're like, this is, you know, the, a certain number of these symptoms line up. And so this is potentially what it can be. And when she even mentioned that to me, I mean, I was in full panic mode because I'm like, if that's the case, like I'm, I'm ruined. My, my like yeah. my entire collection is done. I'll, yeah. I will never sell anybody an animal out of this collection because I would just never trust it. Um, so and again, thank you for that we, wasn't the case. As we increase the number of animals in our collections, the cost of, mm -hmm. of testing all of those becomes so sure. it's terrible. Yes, it does. But it you know, absolutely does. Yeah. So I think that's the, the, the good thing about having a good vet, a knowledgeable vet. Yes. Like I, one of the things yes. I do dislike that I, I get sent links to all the time are people on YouTube that are doing, that are being their own vet and they're lancing out infections and you know that you gotta yeah. be really careful about that you might be keeping snake for 20 years and be able to do it but your average joe might not be in the same situation to do that and can sure so that's a, a bad of, example yeah it's such a really bad example you know so if you're going to spend money on snakes make sure you follow it up with a vet as well most people if they keep a dog they're going to go to the, the vet with their dog or their cat yeah do the same thing with your snake they're not a throwaway animal sure and, and i think that's a sad part expensive. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the sad part is that, um, you know, you've got people that, again, even going back to the housing, the enclosure thing, it's like you've got people that have a $5,000 snake in a $500 rack with, you know, a $50 thermostat on it. And they're like, yeah, this is fine. They're willing mm -hmm. to accept that risk. <clears throat> and and at the same time, they also are like, oh, I don't have a vet. I, I don't know where I would take this animal if it got sick tomorrow. I, I don't have a trust of that. And I understand that certain areas are more difficult, but, um, you know, and they and they don't have the budget for it either. You know, mm -hmm. I see posts all the time and this is, again, this is not knocking anyone. It's just, I, I just wish that people would plan a little bit better. Um, if you don't have the budget to take an animal to the vet, um, mm -hmm. the day after you bought it, then There's maybe you should recon. Yeah. You should yeah. probably reconsider buying that animal. You, you may have jumped yeah. the gun on even buying that animal at all. And the good um, thing with vets nowadays is um, there's a number of really good reptile vets in the U S there are, there are, and yeah, I'm very lucky. What they're willing to, to do is they're willing to work with your vet. So through okay. Zoom or whatever, they can consult with your vet sure. to work at the best treatment for that animal. Um, okay. And so I think there's there's certainly ways of getting around that, you know. Absolutely. Um, do you know of, this is just a sidebar or kind of a, a spin off of that. Do you know of some resources? Because I know, I think um, there was at one point, there was a source for kind of looking up, uh, you know, like reptile specific veterinarians. Um, do you know of a trusted source that you would recommend to people? And, and if not, that's, that's okay. But I, I just thought I would ask. That's a good question. I don't. Um, but you know, something that, that people should think about is contacting their local zoo. Okay. Because zoos will have vets associated with it. And those vets need to be um, knowledgeable in exotic species. Sure. And they should then be able to turn around and say, well, I don't know how to do it, but this is the person you should contact. Sure. Um, so zoos okay. are, and most zoos are, would be willing to at least be able to help you, you know, get in sure. the right contact with that. Yeah. Right. Pass yeah. a phone number along and a name or whatever. Yeah. That's great That's advice. It. That's great advice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But otherwise there, there should be a resource online that, you know, for exotic species vets, I suppose if you, I, in Google, if you typed in exotic species vets, um, sure. Something might come up, you know, but yeah, I want to say even like, there was something like through NARBC <laughs> or something. I'll, if, if I find it out later, I'll, I'll post it. We don't have to dive into yeah, that. Like, you know, just, we're, 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 U.S. Arc are going to be redesigning their website. That that would be a good link to kind of have in yeah. U.S. Arc. I suppose the problem with it is keeping it keeping it updated. 
current. Yeah. You know, you've got these vets that either disappear or. Yeah. Cause I, I had that issue. Yeah, yeah. Where there was a vet that I'd called and they were like, yeah, that we don't work with those anymore. Or that vet doesn't yeah. even work here anymore or whatever. But anyways, like I said, not with Facebook. That's the kind issue. of thing you should be on Facebook. You know, a good Facebook should. group. For yeah. Should, yeah. Vets. For sure. Uh, here's the link. an area of opportunity there. Again, I try and stay away from Facebook stuff, but um, I think that's something that people could probably. There um, it is. Riley. Go, Riley's, just, Riley's just posted it. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Um, Thanks, Riley. Yeah. Thankfully, you know, if you're keeping your animals, I, I have very rarely had to take snakes to the vet. Sure. And in fact, yeah. in fact, never in my 15 years in the U.S. Uh, a couple of times in Northern Ireland with wild type stuff that I brought in to get wormed and stuff like that there. But um, sure. Um, but yeah. You know, invest your time and look into it if you need it, and don't Absolutely. don't just think, oh, it'll get better. Yeah, <laughs> have a plan. Yeah, especially with these expensive animals, I I'm always amazed at people spending a lot of money on a snake and not bringing it to the vet to get some kind of treatment if it's got a swelling or uh, this or that. Yeah, you know? yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Dr. Booth, outside of uh, just reptiles, uh, a big part of both Zach and my life is uh, is music. And yeah, obviously saying. looking, you know, <laughs> right behind you, you got your base right there. Yeah, but we do a couple time. segments every week. Yeah. And uh, one of those segments that we do with all of our guests every week is a band or musician of the week. And it could be anybody from the past, present. Mm -hmm. It could be your friends that you're shouting out. Just uh, any band or musician that uh, our listeners should should check out. Wow. <clears throat> Who would I recommend? I suppose I, I suppose I would have this. I would have to throw out a friend of mine. So please do. We love it. A good friend of mine, a guy called Simon McBride. He's in Northern Ireland. He's, he's one of the best guitarists that you'll ever hear, and a blues rock guitarist. But he's, I, uh, I, whenever I was like fifteen, I was watching TV, and he was on like these TV shows, like this young guitarist who was playing like Joe Satriani stuff and Eddie Van Halen stuff. Just mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> I remember sitting thinking, God, I'd love to play with a guy like that. And I yeah. was, a couple of years later, I was working in a music store, and he came in, and we, we, he's now one of my best friends. That's but amazing. He, um, at 15, he got endorsed by Paul Reed Smith Guitars. He's played with, you know, he plays with, like, Don Airy from Deep Purple and Ian Gillum from Deep Purple and records his own stuff. Amazing guitarist, Simon McBride, just absolutely incredible guitarist. Great musician, great singer, great player. That's um, that's what I would throw in. And other than that, just listen to diverse stuff. You know, so yeah, I listen to everything from Barry White to Bon Jovi to Van Halen. To, uh, yeah, I love it. You know, so <laughs> you know, you're in good uh, company. Yeah. Toto is the current one I'm listening to a lot. So yeah. Love yeah. And for those that don't know, you you were a touring musician for a while. I think a yeah, lot of people I, uh, know that now, but I I still meet people and I've spoken about you to people and they're like, wait, what? I didn't, I didn't know that. Like yeah, yeah. before, yeah, before uh, during my. PhD around that time I, I gigged five nights a week um, so in cover bands wedding bands all that kind of stuff and then touring with uh, original stuff a lot of recording yeah I played yeah. bass for 30 uh, what am I 43 I've been playing bass for 30 33 years 32 years so I've got yeah. I got some of these ones on the wall and I've got another yeah. Yeah. five or six down there so yeah sadly I don't beautiful play much anymore you know, yeah, I, you I got some beautiful I, instruments on your Instagram. I've seen yeah, the pics and photos. I mean, they're they're just gorgeous. I I, I love uh, I love the look of your your bass. It's very clearly been well loved. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I just I have an appreciation for that. It's brand new. I built it. Um, I built it last year. Really? Are you a luthier as well? No, but I can I can do kind of stuff like that. But, <laughs> oh, I was gonna uh, say like all, that's amazing. All aged, you know. So it's, this one's built to look like the fender that Sting uses. Yeah. So. I built that one and then it's gorgeous. I built this one. There's a bass player called Pino Paladino, and I built that kind of to look like his. So, yeah, yeah, kind of cool stuff. That was that was my COVID lockdown projects. What pickups are you putting in the ones that you built? That one's got Lindy Fralin, uh, Lindy Fralin like '51 reissue pickups. That one's got a 1954 Fender Jazz. Oh, sorry, Fender Precision. Custom shop pickup, but normally in my other bases I use. Um, let's see, oh, this is the oldest base I've got. I bought this new in 1993. Um, I use EMGs, okay. so active pickups. But I yeah, use so uh, my, my 
my go-to setup in my guitars is the EMG 8581s. Yeah, the Zach Wilds. The yeah. Zach Wilds or the Kerry yeah. Kings that's got the 30 game boost that comes yeah. with it. When I worked in that music store, I used to install a lot of Zach Wild 85, 81 pickups. So, yeah, I, uh, yeah, the only one that I've got that doesn't have EMGs in those, I've got a custom shop Warwick that they built for me years ago. And it's got their MEC pickups, I think. The great one about that is as you get older, it's got that curve in the back. So it's got the beer belly kind of curve. <laughs> yeah, I I just don't get to play much anymore. So I actually had a friend text me tonight asking about getting together to, to jam. So I might do that at some point. It's finding the time. I just, I just don't really have the time. So I'm probably going to build another base before I get to play out with other people. So yeah, so sometimes that's that's almost more fun. Oftentimes, is, is the build process of, and, and that's everything. You know, I I, I love building. You know, I was in salt water for a while, and like. 90% of the time, the setup was almost more fun than the keeping after the fact. I got more enjoyment yeah. out of that. So Yeah, yeah. I get yeah, it. The guitars are really easy to build, so. Sure. Not hard. But it's Once you get I can imagine. It's not easy. Yeah, they're not, yeah they're it's like a baby. Hard to do. So, yeah, they're yeah. fun. But I look at those. I built them, I don't know, a year ago. And I really haven't played them. In fact, that, that Fiesta red one, I haven't even plugged in. Wow. So, <laughs> I built it a year ago. That says something. That's, that tells you how much I'm getting to play it. So, yeah. Yeah. Music. Music's a really big part of my life. You know, constantly listen to music. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, constantly. So. Love it. So, so you, Zach, with got, that uh, said, what, what have you got? What, what guitar have you got? Those uh, pickups in? Uh, I've got the eighty-five, eighty-one, in several different guitars. Uh, I've got it in a uh, a Schecter Damien Elite. And mm -hmm. that's not a very expensive guitar, but mm -hmm. I love how that guitar plays. Yeah, like the uh, quality of Schecter is great. The uh, the action on that guitar is super low. The mm -hmm. intonation is perfect, and yeah. uh, like that's that's my guitar. That like that's my go to. Like if I'm just gonna play around the house and grab a guitar, yeah. that's the one that I grab. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I've got the uh, eighty five eighty ones in a uh, Epiphone Les Paul. Cool. Uh, and it, I wanted to get the uh, the Bullseye Zach Wild custom. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I actually want a Wild guitar now that he has. His oh own, yeah, like, his own stuff. Yeah, his own stuff. Uh, I I'm a huge Zach Wild fan. Like he's a funny uh, guy. I met him. Um, he's hilarious. I met him well, sixteen years ago in in, in the UK, and uh, he at one of the uh, music festivals, the Download Music Festival in the UK. He's a he's a funny funny guy. You know, um, yeah, his, but I've seen him a bunch of times here in Tulsa when they do the um, Experience Hendrix tour. I'm a big Hendrix fan. And I got to the point where I couldn't listen to him much because there's so much pinch harmonics. Everything yeah, he loves the pinch. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, but he's awesome. And yeah, I saw that he's got his own brand of guitar. I hadn't followed that. So it, it's funny this. you say that. Uh, a friend of mine, actually, the guy that does all my tattoos, when uh that's when he put out that song fire it up you know mm -hmm. however many years ago my buddy would uh he would make fun of me and every time i would come in to get a tattoo and he'd be tattooing me, he would play that song he's like all zach wild can do is go wow now 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 and pinch our money <laughs> <laughs> it is like i started listening to him like 20 years ago with his band uh, pride and glory i think it was oh yeah losing your mind like i yeah. love that with yeah, the banjo at the stuff. beginning yeah, and then whenever he did the uh, like label society stuff, I got started following that there. Yeah, he's he's cool. Yeah. I like uh, his band's generally really good as well. Yeah, you know, and I you know follow I followed him a lot with Ozzy Osbourne. So like years ago, I was in an Ozzy Osbourne or in a Black Sabbath tribute band, but we played Ozzy stuff as well. Sure. So uh, there was a, the guitarist was really big into Zach Wild. Well, man, you know the thing about Ozzy that uh, if you look back over Ozzy's career, he's always had great guitarists. You know, yeah, he had yeah, Tony yeah. Iommi, then Randy yeah, Rhodes, yeah. and Andy Jakey Rhodes, Lee, yeah. and Zach yeah. Wild. Yeah. Like he's always yeah, yeah. had amazing guitarists behind yeah, him. Yeah. I mean, not amazing to take anything away from Ozzy. Yeah, the bands yeah. in general we had have always yeah. been just amazing. You know, yeah. there's not just been talent. a talent player in, in among those at all. No. You know, it is funny. Like I, I don't listen to a lot of Ozzy anymore or Sabbath. I think I burnt myself out for playing all that stuff so much. But uh, yeah. I still hear like. No more tears comes on the radio and I blast it up, you know, or yeah. more pigs and I blast it up. But uh, yeah, I was just, just going to say, yep, yep. Good not, stuff, certain you know. things never get old. Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. No, music, as I say, is a music and reptiles are kind of my, my two things. 
you know, mm-hmm. if I'm not, if I'm, even if, if I'm in the reptile kind of room, I've always got music kind of playing or, you know, now I'm just back into that whole vinyl kick. The joys of, you know, every time I go home, I, I pick up more of my vinyl collection and bring it over. It's a pain in the ass, but, you know, I, I, I'm <laughs> investing in that. My kids love it, you know, so. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely you. uh definitely a man after my own heart because uh mm-hmm. that that's my you know music and reptiles that's kind of my thing too yeah no, I'd, Zach, I'd with that being be... said man who's who's your band of the week so you know I, I feel like i've said this one before <clears throat> but i've been listening to him so freaking much here lately um uh it's, it's an individual i can't remember his act his actual name but it, it he goes by the white buffalo um like I said, I don't, I don't know if I've said it on episodes as many of these as we've done at this point. They all kind of blur together. And I, and I do have a, a tendency to kind of have my go-tos where I fall back to. Um, but he was, a, he was actually a songwriter um, before he ever was convinced by his agent. Like, hey, man, like, you're, you need to be like, like let, let me push you out to, to do this. You're, you're super talented. Um, and he actually, I think where he kind of became very known was he, he, he wrote a couple of songs specifically for the show, Sons of Anarchy. And I heard I heard a couple of his songs on there, and it's funny because now there's like my least favorites of his because they're just so overplayed, and it's like what everybody's heard and what everybody's listened to. And um, his other stuff, man, is just so much better. Um, and I can't even really describe it because he, he he's just he's just got this soulful soulful voice. Um, it's one of my it, 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 I, I like anything that I can sing along to, and I, I love to sing his music. Um, it's, it, it's, it's just, man. Yeah. He, he's got, he's got so many songs that just really, really, uh, just kind of speak to your soul, speak, speak to you, uh, just deeply. And, uh, he, he does a lot in terms of like when, uh, he, he does a lot of like live stuff, like literally he'll go live from his garage, just like him with a, with an acoustic guitar. Uh, just, 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 he just loves the music. And, and, and I think I, that's what I love about his story as him being behind the scenes and being a songwriter first. Um, was that he just loved the music. He loved to do it mostly for himself. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm big on stuff like that. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's my guy for this week. Um, I had a couple other names flip around my head, but I, I got to go with that. If anybody's not listened to that, uh, please definitely go go check out Bill White Buffalo. He's uh, a super talented guy. And ignore any of some anarchy stuff. It's, it's a little bit cliche and obviously, like, purposely written. Um, and, again, he's a talented writer. You know, he can do that stuff if he needs to. Um, but this, the, the other stuff that he's written kind of just for himself is, is, is amazing. So. What about you? So mine for the week, uh, the, the reason I'm choosing this guy is because, uh, me and my daughter were watching some YouTube videos and, uh, somehow through the rabbit hole of YouTube, we got back on the, uh, the people that were doing the ice bucket ALS challenge. So uh, that got me thinking about Jason Becker. Oh, wonderful! Yeah. And so Jason Becker well. is my uh, my musician of the week. And man, I went back and like I've listened to a, this week. I've been listening to a lot of cacophony, like Marty mm-hmm. Friedman, Jason Becker's yeah. old. Stuff. Yeah. And like you know, that stuff's not for everyone. Like it, sure. it, that's not a type of music that everybody's just gonna sit down and listen to. But uh, any of you guys that are musicians or guitar players, you know, you'll you'll definitely get a feeling for how talented these guys are. And another thing, you know, about Jason Becker is him having ALS. uh, He never stopped writing music. You know, Mm -hmm. he he couldn't physically play it, but through his eyes, he would, you know, he would write out music for other people to play or for even just a computer to play. But like he, such an amazing and talented musician and the music still in his head that he could create and write out these grand scheme uh, things and they sound beautiful. And like Jason Becker's just, he's a true musician, you know, even without the Mm -hmm. capability to produce it with his own hands, he's still writing amazing music. What's amazing with Jason Becker is that, you know, many people will never have heard of him. But people like Joe Satriani and Steve Vai and Eddie Van Halen all looked at this guy as being, they held him up at a different level. Yeah. You know, and they, you know, they all still spent time with him. Like, by Eddie Van Halen, Joe Satriani so still, still, you know, go and spend time with him and they'll do all these uh, benefit concerts for him and so on. They, they really held him and do hold him at a really high level. An amazing player, just an amazing player. Just 
and that, and he's the, the fact that he developed ALS so long ago and he's still alive. Like I know that recently mm-hmm. he went through a couple of days where it looked like things weren't going well. Um, but um, yeah, just an amazing, amazing player. You know, just it must be terrible to. I don't know. I, I don't know why I was thinking about this when I was on vacation. I, I was just something music. I thought, can you imagine if you lost your ability to play, or you know, I was like, God, that would just be. Yeah. Oof, you know, like I think it, it, to it, like, it, you know, like the drummer in Def Leppard. You know, Rick mm-hmm. Allen losing your arm as a drummer. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, look what he look what he's done since then. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just yeah, it's incredible stuff. Well, I mean, in a, with with that in mind, you know, like he became an innovator. Like he had to completely reshape how people played drums, and I mean, I've first. seen uh, I've seen first. interviews with Joe Elliott where mm-hmm. he talks about how uh, after Rick Allen lost his arm, it uh it changed his, not only you know how he played but how he played, mm-hmm. and yeah, like yeah. he got away from that beat beat and pop pop and beat yeah. you know drum feel yeah, yeah, because he yeah, couldn't yeah. do it the same anymore uh, right, by playing right. with his feels with his feet and yeah, uh yeah. like it, it changed to where he, he wasn't his own in that same role. right he could he yeah. progressed as a musician through it and that's, got, that's yeah, beyond what anyone else would have ever considered like that way of of yeah mm-hmm. of playing right yeah, yeah. I, i've been a Jeff leopard fan for 20 something years 30 years so to go back from the really early stuff you know the first EP, for example and hear that playing right up to I think read about photographs, you know, whenever he still had two arms and so on for the yeah. Romania. Yeah. yeah. And hearing the difference whenever I went to hysteria. But then, you know, listen to that through. Like I think Slang was an album that wasn't well received, but he played acoustic drums and all of that. And it's just amazing. You, when you're hearing that's on my I've got it in my truck right now. You wouldn't even know he did he's got one arm, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, I think it's amazing. Yeah. I think uh, yeah, the fact that he kept going and and uh, and it's just become a better player since then. Mm-hmm. You lose all the complexity, I suppose. You know, too many people overplay. So maybe when you've got sure and have the ability to do that, you just play the rhythm and you, you get yeah, take a different approach. Yeah. yeah, or I mean, yeah. in the same in the same concept, like Tony Iommi losing his fin- you know, Finger getting tips. ends of his fingers <laughs> crushed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I still, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, think about yeah, and imagine the world like what Iommi has played. You know, it's just many people would give up, and then well, there's no war pigs. There's no yeah. Iron Man, you know, there's, it's just wow. so many. Yeah. Well, I mean, and Timeless. even beyond that, like some of the more extreme, you know, aggressive metals that I'm into now, like they wouldn't exist, you know, yeah. like yeah. It, it, there was, and it, there are other people that don't get as much credit for the attribution to metal music. You know, everybody talks about Black Sabbath being the beginning, mm-hmm. and, all, and yeah. there's definitely others that pay, yeah, but uh. You know, like without Tony Iommi and, you know, Richie Blackmore and some of mm-hmm. those guys, like you lose the stuff oh, that yeah. kids now are defending yeah. so much, yeah. saying that, yeah. well, you know, with we don't even listen. Black Sabbath ain't, you know, they're nothing. You got to yeah. listen to this. And yeah, yeah this dude's yeah. playing 240 yeah. beats a minute and he's playing yeah. blast beats on the drums but, and all but this. But where stuff, he gets like, inspiration from? Arpeggios. But he wouldn't have had that to go back to. He wouldn't have yeah. had those things without yeah. those bases set for him yeah. by these pioneers I, before. I did an it's argumentative writing piece in college on Black Sabbath and how, in my opinion, they created, like, they paved the way for metal music today. And that's, yeah. you know, that's just an aside, but yeah. I feel pretty strongly about it. <laughs> it's interesting you say about, you know, people that, that they look up to, right? Just really, I could talk about this in Reptiles, but I'll talk about the music first. Sure. You know, I was listening. I listened to this podcast called "The Rock on Tours." It's by um, Guy Pratt, who was the bass player in Pink Floyd, and um, Gary Kemp, who was in Spando Valley. But they both play in Nick Mason's "Saucer Full of Secrets," the early Pink Floyd kind of thing. Um, and they interview all these different people each week. And the um, the people they the, these you know they, they have people like John Bon Jovi or Paul Stanley or all these other you know immense people, and or Mick Fleetwood. And you listen to like who were their influences. And it could have been like Django Reinhardt. You know, listen yeah. to Django Reinhardt, you know, but this massively influential person, that's what they remember hearing in their sitting yeah. room when they were at home or whatever. I think that's, that's kind of mind blowing, you know? Like, yeah, and you hear a lot of uh, a lot of those guys, like especially Jimmy Page, 
You yeah. know, like if you talk about Jimmy Page, like you you have to bring up Robert Johnson and Howlin' yeah. Wolf and like that yeah, Delta yeah. Blues. Yeah. And a lot of people don't even, you know, associate that old, you know, 1920s Delta Blues mm -hmm. with Led Zeppelin. Like, yeah. but yeah. yeah, a yeah. lot of Led Zeppelin stuff is derivative from yeah. old blues musicians mm -hmm. at that, you know, and I'm a huge Led Zeppelin fan. I'm not trying to trash Led Zeppelin at all. But I mean, a lot of their stuff is rehashed, you know, like mm -hmm. it's it's old riffs yeah. that's brought someone back from those the way. days. Yeah, yeah. yeah, someone else paved the way. But it's interesting because you know, it's the same thing. I can say the same thing about reptile keeping. You know, when people ask me, like, I still find it odd that I look up to these different reptile breeders. Cause all you do is you're just shoveling snake shit kind of thing, you know. But <laughs> yeah. um, but whenever I got into it, it was Ralph Davis, Peter Cal, um, Brian, Greg Shaw, Graziani. Yeah. Greg, yeah. So people that even now, many people getting into don't know these people. Yeah. You know, like Dave and Tracy Barker. Like I, I idolize those people, and now sure. I consider them really close friends, really good friends of mine. It's kind of odd yeah. you know, that I once held, and I still have hold them on a really high pedestal. But then you just realize that they're just people that breed snakes. You know. So, um, but, and then you talk to them about who they were influenced by. You know, and see that's who, that's what I was just going to say. Is and, that's that's the depth, right? Yeah. That's the depth. That's you got to go like go a couple go a couple levers beyond, and then yeah. really you'll have an understanding of where this all came from. And, you'll and that to me is always intriguing. Yeah, you'll realize how short our hobby is, you know, because we can only go yes. back, you know, a couple yeah, a couple generations yeah. really. Yeah, yeah, it goes back to zookeepers or whatever, you know. And, and sadly, many people get into the hobby. Maybe they're not interested in that. I just think it's fascinating, but they lose sure. that understanding of the history of the hobby. Yeah, and uh, those people that kind of paved the way. That wrote the, you know, the Ross and Marzak, you know, cup of husbandry, husbandry of pythons and boas, and boas and pythons, yeah. whatever, you know, the original blue Bible that we called it, you know, and, yeah, yeah. and moved on from there, you know, and I, I, I hate to see these people getting into it, and the only people they think about are these people they've seen on YouTube, you know, sure. they don't sure. think about how this, how we got to this point in time. Yeah, I actually had this same conversation uh, last night. I was on the phone with uh, Earl Jones from Lone Star Reptiles for about three hours last night, <laughs> and he and I had this exact same conversation. And uh, I, I'm actually one of our guests or one of our uh, viewers that's always here, that always uh, <clears throat> watches our stuff, that supports the hell out of us is uh, Tom and Mindy from Timeless yeah. Reptiles and uh, Timeless Morphs. And probably six months ago i had messaged them and like was talking to them and i was telling them i was like hey the guys that you should look up are, and i would mention peter call and you know graziani and michael cole and all these people and uh i was like these are people that you should go back and check out like they mm -hmm. they were bringing you know like the first pastel ball pythons mm -hmm. the first cinnamon ball pythons yeah, like yeah, you know yeah. these things that we we don't even think about them now because it's these single gene animals but like right. They they were the ones who were innovating the the morphs and the you know the polymorphism in ball pythons and looking for that yeah. stuff and seeing these dinker projects straight out of Africa and like yeah. Yeah. It, it's just I, I agree with you that you know we we've lost a lot of that and I've told this story a thousand times on this channel and everywhere else because it's and I'm gonna tell you it's one of my favorite memories one of my favorite experiences in the reptile hobby. Uh, a few years ago at Arlington, myself, Brian Cusco, and uh, Forrest Fanning uh, stood for like three hours just standing there listening to Dave Barker talk to us. <laughs> and like, you know, he's such a wealth of knowledge mm -hmm. that like I could have stood there for the next two weeks and listened to him talk, you yeah, know? Dave, Dave's wonderful. Like I, uh, I remember uh, maybe – Seven years ago, I hosted a, a biology of pit vipers meeting in Tulsa, and Dave came up, and uh, he and I got drunk and argued the shit out of each other. The first night, <laughs> it's just, just uh, multiple reasons why, but yeah, you know, like you know, you'd think it could have came to fucking to blows, you know. But uh, the next day, I was just like, all right, what's next? You know, on yeah, yeah. I see him. I see Dave at the Arlington shows whenever they are. I see him, he and uh, and Tracy a lot. They're just wonderful people. Um, yeah, Tracy. It's just people always think that you know that whenever they credit um, snake breeding and stuff like that, they're the, the VPI. That it's always Dave's name that comes up. Yeah, yep. I love that you mentioned this. I don't want to say that because Tracy's really small, but she is just 
wonderful. She is just yeah. absolutely wonderful. Like I, a couple of years ago uh, at Arlington, we were talking. I was like, oh, you know, God, I remember I, I bought the, the first um, Pythons of the World book. And I said, uh, and I said, whenever I moved to the US, I, for some reason, I was only going to move to the US for three years. For some yeah. reason, I gave away all of my books, all of my reptile books. So oh, the, no. The Ross and the Marzak book, the, uh, the, the Pythons of the World. And Tracy was like, oh, hold on a second. I'm like, and, I, and then I joked with her. I was like, I, Dave brought a copy of that book up to the Pit Fiber meeting for the auction. And I tried to bid on it. Somebody outbid me. I was like, fuck. And Tracy was like, yeah. oh, hold on a second. She picked up a copy, like one of the last ones she had or the last one she had. And goes, there you go. And there's also this wow. book, the Ball Python one. And there's also this one. And she just gave it to me. I was like, how much is it? And she was like, no, no, just take it. Just, just go on. That's you know? wonderful. And, uh, now she's wonderful. We email back and forth about different projects. Yeah. And, uh, now they're, they're wonderful people. I'm hoping to get down to see them uh, once sure. COVID all clears up and stuff like that. Yeah. Sure, sure. They are, uh, yeah, they're real, real important people in the, in the hobby. But, but like I remember, um, I had the pleasure of going to see Pete Cal um, at his place. Um, it would have been 15 years ago. And um, uh, whenever I was moving from, from, from Northern Ireland to here, I, I uh, exported 27 snakes to a friend of mine in Philadelphia. Turned out that they had, had volunteered or had worked with Pete Cal for a number of years or something like that. And they've said, what are you doing oh, this wow. weekend? I was living yeah. in Raleigh and I was going up to see them to, to, to do something. They're like, do you want to go down and see Pete? And I was like, Fuck yeah, that'd be great. And yeah. I remember walking into his place that he had was like in this industrial estate. And there was two rooms, two massive, massive rooms. And one was all ball pythons and one was all boas. And yeah. like, he pulls out these things. And there's the original IMG boa, the very first one, you know. And, you know, there's the first ivory ball python. It was huge. Yeah. Like yeah he had the first pie. Somewhere. The pie, yeah. He, he, well, he, yeah. he didn't get the first pie. He, he, the first pies came into different people. Like Dave Feldmar in the UK had them. I was going to say, he I was think I started had buying them up and collecting yeah. them. Oh, well, yeah. Them. Uh, I think Brian Sharp had one. Um, but um, yeah, the ball python room was funny because I walk into it and uh, he had these large six foot freedom breeder racks. You know, he's pulling them open and there was 10 female pieds and a male pied or 10 female pieds and a candy ball male pied or 10 female pieds. And it was always that 10 pieds, 10 pieds, 10 pieds, 10 pieds with something else. Yeah. And I'm thinking, fuck, at that point, 15 years ago, they were not cheap. Babies were like a thousand. No. Cheap. And then you look yeah. all, along, all along one wall from here, as far as you could see, were all baby racks. And they were pretty much all, all baby ball, uh, pied ball pythons. And then in between the two rooms, I had this massive humidifier that just pumped out humidity. Just this yeah. huge like, smokestack that just pumped into each room. It's cool stuff. I, I, I still, it still blows my mind about the, that whole place. You know, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. But he's, you know, you don't hear about Pete Cal anymore. You don't really hear about Ralph Davis anymore. Like Ralph used to have this great forum yeah. that people would go on to. It was fantastic, you know, and he used to post a lot of great stuff. And, and Ralph saw on the US Art Board. Uh, as a, and I'm on that board, and even then, we don't I really get to talk to him much. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how much he's still in the hobby. Brian Sharp was another one that did great shit stuff, and he's, I think Brian's still bringing some stuff. Um, but these are just you know really cool names that were that were really pivotal to, to what we do. You know, without Greg, you wouldn't have the pastel or the cinnamon. You know, without Pete, you wouldn't have the IMG or really the albino or the jungle or the you know, bunch of other stuff that they did. You know. So it's a it's a very different world. Uh, yeah, then. yeah. But I still, you know, it I, is. You know, I know that Eric Burke um, and Owen at the Morelia Python Radio guys are, are trying to do some of these history and herpetoculture kind of things sure. and bring some of these people on, which is good. Yeah. You know, hopefully, introducing people to those to those kind of um, pivotal people. You know. Yeah, well, it's so, important for us to know where we came from in order for us to move forward in, in, a, in a in a positive way and, and keep taking this and, and just making things better and just not making it about again going back to it just just not about just the money yeah, um you know. i i, I want to ask you i know we're around 23 23 minutes in i i, I did want to ask you and, and you may not have an answer which is okay um but it's important to me because this is something i've been thinking a lot about um do you have any thoughts on directions that people can take people that may be listening to this that are new to the hobby or, or, or not even in the hobby yet um where 
it's, it's a complicated, it's a complicated question. I, I always ask the business questions because it, it's, it's just the way that my mind is wired a little bit. Um, what is, what is something that you think is a direction that someone can take getting into this hobby where they can potentially, uh, not necessarily make a living, but, but they can in, in have this hobby pay for itself without producing. Um, I hear that talked a lot uh, about by a lot of different people in the hobby. Some, some names that I respect a lot where they're even with large collections trying to move more towards where the hobby can pay for itself without being based on the babies that they have to sell to where it takes the pressure off of the breeding in terms of the finances. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that I don't know. You yeah, know, I, I, I know it's a complicated question. Yeah, because at that right. point, it really has That's to my move point. Into, it's sure. gotta be, there's two different ways and go into one is one is through publishing books, and you really hope to have some real education in that before you do sure. that. Sure. And even then, that might not make you a lot of money. And the other is through kind of promotion on YouTube and that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. and even then, that's not necessarily a way that maybe educational. I, I, as I say, I don't follow them. You know, I, I rarely watch sure. uh, YouTube stuff. And um, yeah, yeah. Just because there's so much bad information out there. And uh, absolutely, I agree. Uh, I absolutely so I, agree. I try and avoid that. There, you know. I, I've always, of course, had the, I've always just thought that that I want my hobby to pay for itself with breeding. You yeah. Know? So if I'm going to get a new snake, um, it's got to be with either trades. I I trade a lot. Sure. So it's got to be for babies that I produced, you know, to do that there. Yeah. Um, and and you know my only you know so if I'm buying rodents, I want to say that right. Well, I sold X number of snakes, and that covers the rodents for the year or whatever. Absolutely. I like yeah. I like having a zero cost hobby. Um, yeah. And of course, at some point in time, because we hold back so many things or we buy or get so many other things, you can get to a point where it becomes unmanageable. And that's where the problems arise. Too many people get too many animals too quickly. And then they don't yes. realize that, that rats aren't cheap. And yeah. The enclosures aren't cheap. And thermostats, you know, I just bought a Herbstat 6 and a bunch of heat panels. Um, yeah. And that's and not cheap at all. a lot of money, you know. It's, oh, yeah for a thousand dollars gone in, in seconds. I was going to say, yeah, easily. Um, yeah. So I try my best back in that there, but yeah. Um, I did. Yeah. That's a good. Point. I just don't know how yeah. you can do it without. No. Yeah. Like I said, I, I didn't, ex I didn't like, expect anything uh, necessarily profound, but you're, you're a creative individual yeah, and I, I don't know. Uh, and you, and you, and you've given me a creative answer <laughs> and I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Cause I, I, I've got no idea how much money people. No, but it's a, it's a thought filled Facebook answer or, in the sense or, that, You've at least you've at least presented something that people can think through, and that that's all I'm looking for because that's that's where I'm at with, with the hobby. Um, I, again, you know, I don't want to become uh, you know a person that's got a thousand animals in a room, and I'm just relying upon I need to sell these things, and mm -hmm. um, ultimately, oh, I'm going to produce things that uh, that necessarily are going to end up in pet stores, which is is fine. Those things, as long as I can find homes for everything that I produce, I'm happy. Right. Um, but again, I I, I also. I'm just trying to think outside of that where I don't have to focus on the animal production side of things so much. And, and, and so I'm, this is going to be a, a question that, I, that I'm going to honestly start posing a, a lot more often just but, because it's something that's important to me. So, but what I would think, you know, think about that there, what I would recommend people think about is diversifying their collection. Mm -hmm. Not just keeping ball pythons or, you know, so yes, I've sure. got, I don't know, I've got 50 or 60 Corrales tree boas. Yeah. Um, I've, got, I've got the same with, with Boa Constrictor or Boa Sigma. And yeah. then I've got Dunn's Pythons and I've got Spotted Pythons and I've got Sanzinia. I've got, what else have we got? The, the Caramel Sumatrans. I've got Hognose Snakes. Yeah. Um, there's probably something else in there that I kind of remember. But, you know, I try to I try to at least diversify some stuff, you know. Yeah. There's some, there's some of the Asian rat snakes that I really like. And I think having yeah. those things keeps you interested in it. Yeah, I think if you become a monoculture, then you might get bored very quickly. I think once you got all these sure. different things, you know, like, like what I would, I, I've got tortoises as well. I've got a bunch of tortoises. And yeah, I, I think if um, and I'd love to have varanas. I'd love to have like um, blue tree monitors and some of the mm -hmm. prosinus and stuff like that there. Yeah, I just yeah. can't with, with traveling. I just can't do it. Sure, but, no, um, they're not easy to care for. Yeah, yeah I think I think. Well, I mean, in terms of your traveling. Yeah, yeah. You know, the nice Absolutely. thing with stuff like that is that. You can have very few of them, and if you're successful in breeding them, they're still worth yeah. a lot of money. Yes. And they hold their value. They're not yes. like some things that drop. You know, like yes. a green tree monitor yes. is still going to be expensive. It's going to keep its value yep. for the next 15 years. It's still going to be the same. You know, they're going to be expensive because they're not easy to breed. For sure. For sure. So I think having those kind of things can can help as well. You know, where you can have yeah. fewer animals that are less common but more but still of real interest. Yeah. You know, you can yeah. just fewer of them and still cover yeah. your costs. Yeah. 
quality over quantity if, if you want to simplify yeah. it. But yeah, I, and I, yeah. And I, I love that response. And that's something that I've, I've thought a lot about. And he's had nothing, but that's it. He just uh, I think his phone just died is what happened. Yeah. yeah, the other thing is that I think people need to be careful. Once they get so many animals, they don't want to think they, they, that are easy to breed. It doesn't mean you should breed them all. I've watched two friends, really good friends, in the last year that that um, sold their entire collections because I think they just overwhelmed themselves with, you know, they had 15 boas, females, and they bred them all, and they all took, or a lot of them took, and they were bunch, left with a bunch of babies that they had difficulty selling. You know, just minimize what you're doing. Be selective. For sure. I definitely agree. And I think that, you know, a, a lot of times when like you had mentioned earlier with the idea of investing in animals, you know, uh, there's, I think there's a lot of misinformation to where people get the idea of like a, a get rich quick scheme mm. with, uh, with reptiles. And there's a lot of work that goes into to keeping, you know, as many animals as some people keep. And not only that, like, I, I'm a huge proponent of breed what you love, like mm -hmm. breed what, you know, work with the animals that you like. And, you know, right now, um, as far as my family and what we're doing, we're actually transitioning away from breeding and, uh, you know, going more into like birthday parties and Boy oh, Scout really? events and educational at, at, with schools and stuff like yeah. that. And, uh, you know, we'll continue to, to breed as a hobby. But, you know, uh, as far as like trying to chase the next big gene and all that, like I have no interest in that. Like that's 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 not really what interests me. Unless you've got the money that you can throw away to do that. You've got to realize that whenever people show you this this great animal, they're often already a step ahead of that. You know, the, the smartest people in this hobby will produce an animal. They'll hold it back for a year or whatever. And then they'll show you pictures of it because they've already got either offspring from that or the next line that they're going to produce from it. So whenever you're investing in it, you know, you and the breeder are not on the same playing field. That play, that breeder is on the, sure. the next level, right? Um, so I think um, people have to be careful that once they see a breeder release an animal that is new, you got to realize that it's, you're not entering at the same level as them, even though you can get your male ball python to breed at eight months or whatever, nine months they're already a step ahead or two steps ahead of you. So you got to be careful in, in that sense, you know, it doesn't mean, or even a full generation or two ahead of you, you know, Absolutely. you know, it's, uh, you know, I show stuff that I've got with bows, but I've also got a lot of stuff that I haven't shown because they're kind of the next line of what I want to produce, you know, and I'm holding that back and making sure it's good. And I like it before I'll show pictures of it and stuff like that there, you know? So I, uh, Oh, he's back. Wonderful. Yeah, okay. sorry. I, I really have no idea what happened. My literally, I was talking and listening to you, and then just bam, I was out. I, I, I'm guessing maybe because my phone's dying. It was trying to. Yeah, know. that that that's what I said. I said I guess uh, I figured your phone had died, but uh, since since Zach's back in, uh, we we had you for an hour and a half, and we're a hundred percent, you know, grateful for you giving us the time to come on here, share so much information. Uh, I personally could talk to you forever because like there's so much stuff that you know we don't have time to touch on on here that I would love to talk about but uh if there's any any last message or any last thing that you want to you know just say to our audience we would love that and then uh you know we'll, we'll go ahead and sign off of here yeah I, I don't but um anybody that's got any questions or whatever just feel free to email me oh well message me I, they can get me through Instagram so I just go under uh, boa booth on Instagram, yeah, um, or Facebook, um, they can message me through just Warren Booth or whatever it is on Facebook. A lot of people send me friend requests, and I don't accept them because I don't know them. Um, so if I don't accept it, it's not because I'm being rude; it's just I don't know you. The worst thing people do is send a friend, yeah. friend request, and then like they, they don't even introduce who they are. But I've also got a, a Boa yeah. Booth Facebook page that I, I still kind of look up. But Instagram is when I kind of that and Messenger. So I'm, I'm always happy to, to talk snakes sure. and, to, and to, uh, to help. So I can do whatever I can. If I can help, I'm happy to do it, you know. So, and if I'm, if you see me at a show, I Absolutely. tend to go to Arlington um, uh, twice a year. So if you see me, just feel free to 
they grab me and put me to the side and, and talk then. Yeah. Always happy to Warren, thank you so much in all seriousness. And, and uh, I, I meant what I said in my Facebook post previously, you know, I met you at Arlington and uh, I did, you know, I just walked right up, talked to you and, 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 and you're, you are one of the kindest people in the hobby. You're, you're always more than willing to share, obviously, um, your time and, and your information of all of this. And, 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 and it truly is just, um, you, you contribute a lot. I, I want to go back to just really quick. You do a lot of research for the hobby, literally basically on your own dime with your own time. Um, because you're passionate about this stuff, because it's a love that you have. And, and, and I just want to personally thank you for that. Um, I hope that other people out there understand how much you contribute in that way. Um, you're doing a lot of things that, that, that people are really not aware of, and you don't ask for any recognition for that. So I want to give you some just at the very end of this. So again, thank you so much, and, and thank you for time. appreciate that. Bradley, you want will, to close will, this out? Will you, be, sorry, will, will you be at Arlington this year or in September? Any, I will, yes, sir. yeah. Yeah, I'll yes, be sir. I'll be at September. Yep. Cool. I'll see you, I'll see you there. We're gonna grab another beer together. So sounds good. So uh like Zach said, thank you for all that you do. And again, thank you for coming on here with us. Uh I, I've had a great time. Uh everybody that is listening to this, you know, follow up, go follow everything that uh, Dr. Booth is doing. Uh if you look at his Instagram, he's got some really cool animals on there. Uh, make sure you guys come in with us next week. We have another great guest, and uh, we love all of you that feel like you are connected by creatures. See you next week, guys. Love y'all. We'll see y'all soon. Thanks a lot. Bye, guys. Appreciate it.